Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the White House app. And I'm a little bit late because I was messing around in wind grids, trying to get a cross-section thing going because we've got some isotropic uh, uh, lift in our area. And there's some of it you can see outside just before dusk. The rain's starting to come down. And, <clears throat> and you can hear a little bit of that. Give me a second while I uh, get hydrated here. And we'll be back in... Just a moment. Okay, let's give that a <clears throat> give that a try here. Okay, taking a look at the uh, current weather. Got a lot of cold air over the uh, central and eastern U.S. And there it is right there. And we can see that there's a pretty broad gradient from the northeast coast all the way to the Mississippi. And then following that up into Alberta and western Canada. Not so much in the southwest U.S. In fact, you take a look out in the uh, Pacific, things are looking pretty clear out in that area. So... That makes it a lot easier to define where the fronts are going to be. Looks like one up here near Vancouver. And on the back side, we've got uh, probably a warm front coming up to Alberta like that right there. Down in Texas, well, or for the southern U.S. that matter, pretty good gradient all the way down to the Gulf Coast. So we've probably got some sort of front all the way back here into West Texas and then probably banked up against the Rockies, kind of like that. The potential temperature analysis shows a very similar picture. A little bit of a gradient coming from eastern Tennessee down to Louisiana. And we know that there's probably a boundary offshore, maybe somewhere in this area. And then we pick that up into the front range of the Rockies, kind of like that. And that connects up with the next system, which is up in Alberta. All right, uh, let's see here. Let's take a look at what's going on around the world right now. We've got some polar air being manufactured up in northern Manitoba up to Hudson Bay. Looks like it is the cold spot for the northern hemisphere. Things very cool compared to Asia, which is above normal. A little bit of cold air production up near Pevec. That's the only city I know in that area. Yakutsk is down here. Yeah, probably up in that area. But it's getting to be that time of year where it starts cooling down in that part of Siberia. Looks like a lot of heat there in the uh, former uh, Stan Republics. I think they call it the Stan Republics. Like Kazakhstan and Taj Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and stuff like that. All right, uh, let's see here. Looking at the satellite, we need to bump this up to the 31st. And there we go. This will give us our visible imagery for a little bit earlier today. And there's Texas with uh, some cloud overhead. Pretty good weather in Florida and up to the uh, east coast. And then out west, you can see the marine layer right off the coast of San Diego, and you can really make out where the edge of the valley is. There's the Los Angeles Basin right there, and stratus and fog all the way up to the mountains right there, probably up near Ron's Place and all the way up to Malibu. And some of it looks like it goes inland around... Uh, uh, I think my geography is a little bit off in that area. I don't know the uh, central coast too well, but uh, looking pretty good up in Calif California there, northern California. All right. NHC looks uh, pretty clear. One little disturbance way out there into the Atlantic. And let's take a look at the 250 millibar analysis. Northwesterly flow coming in from northern British Columbia into Montana, so we know it's going to be kind of a cold pattern 
in the northern high plains in this area here. We've got a zonal flow, kind of a split flow in the uh, southern U.S. area from southern Arizona out to uh, Texas. So whenever we have a little bit of a southerly component, that's probably a good sign that we're going to have some sort of inclement weather. With uh, zonal flow across the uh, Rockies, kind of a barrier flow like that, that means you're going to get cyclogenesis, lee side development, and that's going to pull the winds around from the south. And that's what we have going on right now. All right, I decided to look at the NHC, or I'm sorry, the SPC picture. This is the 850 millibar analysis. And what we see here is southerly flow up in Texas. And look at those dew points there. These are dew point temperatures. If you look on the bottom here, this is a one hour forecast. This is the RAP model, the rapid refresh. So this is not observed data, but it's a pretty good representation of what we should be seeing. So it looks like we have moisture streaming northward, southerly winds. And this is going to be important, as you'll see here in a minute. 700 millibar flow also has a bit of a uh, southwesterly component there. And then, let's see here, 500. Picking up a 60 knot flow out of the west-southwest. Okay, I wanted to bring up the radar because we do have, do have some rain in the area across East Texas that came through Dallas earlier today. And it's continuing to move east. And there's been a little bit of wet bulbing behind this rain here. You can see the dew points are down in the 40s. That means our wet bulb temperatures will probably be somewhere in between that temperature spread, that uh, dew point depression spread. So we started out with temperatures in the 60s, and they came down pretty quickly once it started raining. So why do we have all this rain? There's some of the rain out of the Shreveport radar. Let's take a look at the isentropic maps. This is from College DuPage. That's going to be under their isentropic maps tab under weather analysis tools. That'll bring that up right there. Okay, so the we start out with the uh, left side. See up here at the top, there's like uh, different Kelvin levels. And we usually start with the colder temperatures and try to get an idea of what it's showing. And it's showing 1,000 millibars across Texas. That's probably a little bit too close to the ground, so we'll take it up to 285. And I'm going to go ahead and bring it up to 290 here and maybe 292. So what do we see here? We've got a 925 line across Texas. 925, if you remember, that's up at about 2,500 feet. It's really good to memorize these levels. It's really critical for working with upper air data. And similar with 850, that's going to be up at 5,000 feet. And then the 700 millibar level, or I'm sorry, the 7,500 foot level, that's going to be up at about 775 right there. So you notice as we go north, we get into higher and higher isotropic surface levels. These are levels of potential temperature here. And generally, up in, around the cold air, they're bumped up to higher levels. So what, what's happening here is the air tends to cling to the isentropic surfaces. And as it moves across Texas, we've got easterly winds down here at about uh, 3,000 feet. That's carrying it northward and then up over this uh, cold dome over Kansas and Oklahoma. And if we go up even higher to 294 and 296, look at that right there. Very strong isotropic lift. And you can see that is any kind of north, uh, any kind of southerly wind goes very strongly uphill from about 2,500 feet in South Texas 
up to about 5,000 over Waco, and then up to about 7,500 over the Red River. And we've got a lot of humidity. These green lines are mixing ratio, or the, the yeah, I'm sorry, the green lines are relative humidity. And we've definitely got saturated air there, and any kind of lift that you get of a humid layer is going to, going to produce clouds and rain. So we go up a little bit higher, still a lot of isentropic lift, and only when we get up to about maybe 300 to 305 Kelvin, that lift goes away and it actually starts drying out there. Now we're up at about 10,000 feet or so. So most of the rain-making processes are down at about 5,000 feet there. And there can be a little bit of convective activity on top of that. So we'll take a look at the uh, sounding for Fort Worth. And uh, if you're kind of confused about uh, isentropic analysis, I do recommend uh, Weather Analysis and Forecasting Handbook on my website at weathergraphics.com. Okay, we're going to take a look at the Fort Worth uh, sounding, and there it is right there. This is for this evening, about an hour ago. And it's not really showing that... Uh, it's not really showing that southerly wind down there in the low levels, mostly westerly flow, but you can definitely make out the front. The top of that frontal layer is up at about 850 millibars, which is up at about 5,000 feet, and above that, fairly tropical air mass. And down below, this is where we have a lot of clouds. This is the uh, frontal inversion that's going to be down at about 4,000 feet or so. Okay, elsewhere, we'll take a look at Del Rio. They're going to be a little bit further west and a little bit drier, but there you can see the cold dome up at about uh, 7,000 feet. And if you look at the winds right here, the winds are kind of southerly within that cold layer there. And we'll try going down to Corpus Christi all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Now it looks a little bit more tropical. I don't really see any evidence of that cold air. And I'm just going to take it down to Brownsville very quickly. I'm wondering whether we do have a front out in the Gulf or not. Temperatures are a little bit mild for that area. There could be a very old stagnant front out there in the Gulf. Those pressures were kind of high out there in the Gulf, and that's what's making me think that. And probably some sort of stronger boundary, like a warm front just south of uh, central Texas there. So yeah, I was playing around with the wind grids. And what I did is I made a cross-section across Texas. Let me see if I can show you that. Okay, so there's a Texas map, and I'm going to draw a line from just south of Brownsville. I hope this works, and then I'll do another one near Topeka, Kansas. Okay, now i got to figure out how this works. Okay, map select. Well, we can uh, just key that in manually. I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, let's try that. I'm going to... Oh, okay, okay, I see what's going on here. I'm sorry. I'm, I need to set the cross-section... Okay, even that's not working. That's strange. Okay. 
anyway, I've got these set up correctly. It's along the 97 line, so that's going to go through around Austin and around uh, DFW all the way up to uh, around I-70 in Kansas. So we'll give that a try. You can, yeah, there it is. I don't know if you saw that line there. And I'm going to pull up the isentropic cross-section. So this is one way we can uh, look at the air mass. And it doesn't, doesn't look like it's gridded, but what you're looking at is on the uh, left side, this is Kansas. Here's Oklahoma, here's Texas, and here's Mexico. Okay. And then Mexico right there. So, near the uh, lower layers, near the lower <laughs> come on, wind grids. Okay, I'm going to rerun that. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, you see that layer right there? That's the uh, frontal surface just barely showing up there. Starting around South Texas and then going up with height. We can follow the top of that to maybe about 10 or 15,000 feet over Oklahoma. And what does this do over the next 12 hours? I can run this forward hour by hour. See how this changes? It looks like a little bit of lift across Texas right there. The yellow, that's uh, the jet, subtropical jet across Texas, and the polar front jet way up there in Kansas. And the packing of these green lines, that's the stratosphere. So that line probably right through here is the tropopause. So now we're up to, uh, let's see here, we're up to 6 p.m. You can see that frontal surface right there. A little bit of lift above that. There's 1Z, 2Z, that's going to be about 9 p.m. There's 10. A little bit of uh, a, a geostrophic flow there around the uh, subtropical jet or over Texas. And then we get to the end of the uh, sequence right there. So that's pretty cool. I'm trying to figure out how to get that working. What I was trying to do before we started the webcast, I was trying to plot wind vectors that are parallel to this frame right there, you know, so you could see the wind blowing the wind component aligned with the chart and really visualize those winds there because it's the flow up these surfaces with lots of humidity that causes the rain and clouds that we have tonight. Okay, there's the uh, satellite. Uh, let me see what we got in chat here. Uh, Sue M, Spooky Weather Ghouls, Electric Dog is here with some emoticons. Marshall Reese, High Winds in uh, Southern Wyoming, Semi Blown Over on I-80. Burl H is with us, and uh, David Moore and Brett Dean. Cold going down into the mid-30s in, in South Jersey. Mike R. is here from San Francisco, preparing for a potent weekend storm for Northern and Central California. Got Michael Burrell, 13, here, and Fred Reamer and Ryan Toomey's. Cooler in South Florida, highs around 78 to 79. Yeah, that's a welcome change there. Fred Reamer saying this is a geography lesson. Megan John, 27, in Minnesota. Sue M. Uh, says those stands are called. Okay. Uh, sound stormy at the house. Yeah, we got a little bit of rain coming down. Fun with Tech is with us. How much rain have we received here? Probably about 0.07. Around 0.07 or 0.08. Not too much. The model that showed the subtropical jet was really cool. Yeah, I'm going to keep working that with that and try to get 
some good graphics for us to look at. What you were looking at here, this was the uh, the rapid refresh. Let me bring up another frame here because some of these other charts were pretty cool. There's a plot of the temperature. Let me back that up to uh, the current time. So you're looking at weather right now. I'm going to put this up to uh, 9 p.m. And I can see down at the bottom, forecast hour is 2, so that's what we want. Okay, so there's the temperature profile, the red showing the warmer temperatures where it's above freezing and the blue where it's below freezing. It's very hard to pick out the uh, stratosphere looking at this because it looks like everywhere the temperature is dropping with height. It's a little bit cooler. There's a little bit of tilt to these lines towards the cold air down in this direction here. So yeah, we do have colder air in this area. It definitely shows up in this region. But potential temperature is really what kind of draws out the detail in these cross sections. So you get a much different picture, especially up in the stratosphere. And another thing that you notice, uh, it says relative humidity is every 10% brown lines. So what do we see here? We've got, looks like relative humidity is around 40% throughout much of the trop troposphere here. And then you go up here into this region, the stratosphere. And look how the moisture drops down to the 20s and the teens. Normally, the humidity in the stratosphere is going to run about 15%. It's pretty much like that all the time there. And you can see how dry it is. So sometimes you can follow the, the uh, stratosphere folds not only by looking at the momentum fields, but also by the relative humidity. You'll see the stratosphere kind of bending down where there's strong vertical circulations going on. And I haven't really messed with these other products. Uh, this is potential temperature showing the gradient right there, the front, and then circulation in the plane of the cross section. I guess those are vertical circulations there. Just, you know, some more stuff to look at and you can really see the stratosphere right there because we're using potential temperature. And normally there's a pretty good spread in the troposphere because it's kind of unstable. There's kind of like a steep lapse rate or at least a moderate lapse rate. And then you get up to the stratosphere and you have a very... Uh, you have a lapse rate that goes the other direction. It warms with height or is neutral there. So you're going to get a very rapid increase in potential temperature in that layer right there. And that is the stratosphere. And of course we also do have plan graphics. Let me see if I can bring that up. There's that cross-section we were looking at right there. It goes right through Oklahoma City. But there is other products we can look at. 500 millibars. We can do a basic chart. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh, That's the uh, current conditions right there across uh, Texas and Oklahoma. And I'll try one more here. Cape. Well, we're not going to have too much cape because uh, elevated cape would be very helpful in this kind of situation. I don't think I see any elevated indices right here. But I'll put on cape here. We'll see what it shows. And it looks like most of the good cape is down to the south here. Let me see if I can move that south. Yeah, that's the uh, some of the tropical air around the Corpus Christi area. And we saw on the soundings there at Corpus Christi located right there, we saw that we didn't have any cold air at the surface, a little bit of a 
moderately unstable, slightly unstable profile there. Anyhow, if we do want to look at stability, we've got the SPC mesoanalysis. We've got these thermodynamic panels here. We were looking at probably the surface-based based method there. Let's see if I can get that to come up. And yeah, it kind of shows a very similar picture there. A little bit of instability there around the Corpus Christi area up to about 500 to 1,000. But if we want to look at uh, storms that are elevated above the cold layer, we have to use different expressions here. One is most unstable CAPE, and that takes the parcel that has the highest theta E level. And it looks like there is a little bit of elevated CAPE. See that uh, much different picture. Now, the yellow, this is all convective inhibition. And let me double check that real quick. Okay, I'm sorry, that's lift, lifted parcel level. Okay, so never mind that. That's just showing where the parcel saturates there. But beneath that, you can see the red lines there showing the cape. And it does extend north over the cold air. And we can see about as high as 250 across Dallas. And finally, a very handy layer is the, uh, let's see here. I guess they don't have effective layer. Okay, well, never mind. Uh, let's see, bulk shear. We can take a look at helicity real quick. We probably don't have enough... Uh, convection going on right now, but yeah, there's a little bit of helicity there, 200 to 300, and if we had uh, a good trigger to get storms going and uh, organize them, we would have a little bit of potential there, maybe for some rotation, although the elevated nature of these storms would kind of work against that. So we can see the winds are kind of light at the surface. At 925, they're out of the south to the southeast. And then at 850, they're out of the west. So that's the reason we have the helicity there. Kind of a, of a big directional change. And let me check that out on the Pivotal Weather site. Okay, I'll bring this up to the uh, current time here. And I'm going to set this on uh, East Texas and bring up a photograph. And we should see a little bit of curvature there because of that directional change. And yeah, there it is right there. Very, very slight uh, curvature, mostly in the elevated uh, like 2 to 4 kilometer layer there. Okay, I'm just taking a quick look at uh, what values it's showing here. All right. Anyhow, uh, let's see here. We have a uh, moist adiabatic uh, lapse right here. Looks uh, very tropical there in the East Texas area. And I guess we could go ahead and roll forward and uh, look at the forecast. So let's do that. So that gave us a little bit of a workshop there on isotropic lift. Uh, what I'm doing right now, I've been working on the book all day. Let me see if I can bring up... Uh, yeah, this will give you kind of a sneak peek of what it looks like. I'm still, still working on it. This is uh, Adobe InDesign that shows some of the... the uh, 
thermodynamics chapter chapters I'm still working on. And uh, this is mostly a draft. However, I think uh, I'll probably get this finished in the next uh, week or maybe 10 days. We should. It's definitely going to be out in November, no question about that. Okay, so let's head to the forecast. If I can find it. Uh, when I come in here and start the webcast like this and open up this tab, I, it opens 37 windows when I do that. And I have to go through each one and make sure it's all updated. So it's, uh, there's some work that goes into the webcast here. All right, let me get this set up here. Okay, starting out, there's that little isentropic uh, lift area. South winds feeding up into this uh, area of pressure falls in New Mexico and Colorado. And that is really the key reason why we have the isentropic lift. Low level pressure falls there attracting and accelerating parcels in the low levels toward this uh, pressure fall there. Up and over the cold dome and it saturates and dumps rain on us. So over the next uh, few days, let's see here by Wednesday, tomorrow evening, we've got a bit of a front up in uh, the Dakotas, Nebraska, right there like that. Not very much southward movement on this. I think we've got kind of a southwesterly flow kind of keeping it at bay. And then for Thursday, yeah, not much progress on this front just yet. Looks like maybe one wave there over Washington. Looks uh, stormy in that area. Looks like a wave there in Texas. And then the front goes up into the Great Lakes like that. So we're going to have downslope in Texas on uh, Thursday, and that's going to keep things pretty warm. Probably some spots here in the uh, mid to upper 80s. And then for Friday, the cold air doesn't uh, go south very much, maybe down to this area here. Oklahoma getting some of the cold air still remains warm in Texas. And things become stormy out there in northern California, up into the northern Rockies. Then for Saturday, system comes through California there. And through the northern Rockies, looks like a lot of snow there in Idaho. So there's the situation there, lee side trough down through Colorado, bringing a southerly flow up across Texas, going to be warm and humid for this weekend. And for Sunday, another cold push comes south, driven by this high over Montana. And we missed it, but that system pulled out of Idaho there on Saturday and a Sunday. See that right there? It starts out there uh, in Montana, comes out into Manitoba there on Sunday afternoon. And then for Monday, let's see, going ahead. Looks like we've got another stuck system making it down to Oklahoma, not much further south, and things kind of gathering once again in California, Nevada. Pressure falls breaking the southward movement on the front. And then for Tuesday, very similar picture there. Looks like the upper level system is kind of weak, maybe moving through Cal uh, Colorado there. And then for Wednesday, looks like that system finally moves down into Texas. Uh, this is on the 8th, and that upper level wave moves in through Georgia moves basically across Texas in about 24 hours, and we get some storms here in that region. Okay, pressure falls offshore in California, so more storms on the way. There it is for uh, Thursday the 9th. A little bit of a backdoor front in Texas there. More cold air coming across the Rockies. And then we get a blast southward of cold air on the 13th and 14th there. 
So what this means is for the central U.S. at least, it's going to be pretty warm for the first week of November and maybe the half of the second week. And then we will start cooling down with a little bit of these uh, mild polar outbreaks. And then we get back into kind of a southerly flow once again for the 16th. So, all right, I think we covered a lot of ground there. Went 40 minutes there. Let me take a quick look at chat. Got Ron, Ron Chalfant here and uh, Burl H. Fred Reamer talking about uh, wind grids and isotropic analysis. Sue M. says, don't forget to hit like. Andrew Hotchkiss says the geographic cross-sections were unclear. Yeah, for some reason, sometimes the when I do the cross-sections, you can see the graphics here are kind of glitchy. Normally, when I, you see that grid come up there, sometimes it plots the grid and it stays on there, and other times it doesn't stay on there at all. So I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, see there, no no grid. I'll have to figure out why it's uh, doing that. Maybe it's just some setting I need to look at. So anyway, that's about all I got for tonight. I appreciate you all watching. Uh, how far does the 540 line go south? Not too far south. Probably staying there up in Nebraska, or yeah, around Nebraska, Iowa. We need a really good polar outbreak to drive that south into Texas. And Ryan says storm system showing up again in the Atlantic seaboard on the GFS and European model. Okay, thanks for watching, and please go to weathergraphics.com and pick up uh, book or software. Uh, would be appreciated if that is, you know, if you're not. Uh, doing the Patreon donation thing. Either way, if you do one or the other, that'll definitely help out. So please uh, keep that in mind. Anyway, that's about all I got for uh, this evening. And I'll just wrap, sorry, I'll wrap that up and get our outro music going. And I will talk to y'all later. Take care and uh, we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>